Ever had a bad day marching? I guess I did because the following Saturday in September of 1965, I got challenged not by one person, but by two. And by mistake, the assistant director let them both take me on. I overblew the challenge by playing too hard into a very small coronet and I was pushed out. I was somebody beat me in my, to my spot. I went to the locker room in the old stadium band room, nursing my wounds until I learned how to stand up for myself for the first time. I grabbed my ax, went back to the practice field where the, the assistant director was still auditioning four one-on-one -on -one challenges. I went to him and I said, if I can beat all those guys, can I have my spot back? He said, yeah, you can go for it if you want to. I did, and I got my spot back just in time to march in the Illinois game where we introduced Sloopy. It was the Iowa game in November of 1957. We won that game by a score of 17 to 13, assuring us of a trip to the Rose Bowl. Well, post-game, we were on the field with a lot of other people. It turned out one was a Sports Illustrated photographer. So fast forward to October of 1958, and this appears on the newsstand. And what you see there is myself in front, behind me is Jess Stewart, and behind him, Harry Williams. Well, that cover has legs. It's October 2020, 62 years later, and there are several copies for sale online as I speak. So the cover lives on, and so is the special memory of Tabitha. Being secretary was a year-round job. Uh, I lived in Columbus, so I've, I worked all summer and all through the school year. And even when I went back to grad school, Jack would come along and he'd say, well, can you work for me this summer? And that was always a good deal. So um, he, would, he would spend most of the summer at Lakeside up on Lake Erie. But I was always invited to go up a couple of times to have him sign letters and talk over what work that I had to do. And at first I went by myself and we'd have such a good time. But after a while I said, why don't you bring some of the kids with you, you know, that were on campus. So we wound up, but we'd have wonderful times up at, at uh, Lakeside. And I thought you might like this picture because Jack kind of frowns down off the wall in the uh, band room, but this is he fixing breakfast for all of us kids at the, the uh, place in uh, Lakeside. My first year in the band was 1954, and I think as all of us remember our first ramp entrance, our first script Ohio, and the many firsts you do as a first year member of the band, uh, I was fortunate that at the end of the year we had an undefeated football trip and we were going to the Rose Bowl. I remember coming home at Thanksgiving and talking to my parents and family about the Rose Bowl trip. And first thing my dad said, well, what's that going to cost me? And I told him, not a cent. The Alumni Association is sending us and it just won't cost you anything. Well, we got there and the day of the game, it poured down rain. We got soaked in the parade, completely soaked. And then I remember standing in front of the Rose Bowl, getting ready to go in with the band and just looking up at the big sign and saying, after all those years of watching it on television, I'm here. I'm here at the Rose Bowl. Pouring down rain? Don't care. Well, uh, at halftime, Woody Hayes tried to keep the band off of the field, both bands, in fact. And fortunately, he was overruled by our president, who said if we sent the band 2,000 miles, then they're going to perform. Uh, Woody was right in one respect, however, because when we came off the field at halftime, uh, having done Script Ohio, the OHIO was firmly stomped into the turf of the Rose Bowl, and even at the end of the game, we could still see Ohio on the field. Here is uh, part of a Rose Bowl uh, t-shirt, sweatshirt actually. Uh, my wife saved the good part. As you can see by looking at me now, I uh, would have outgrown it. Uh, and it was kind of raggedy anyway. So we've got this from 1955 and we've got this from the 1958 trip. So I, in my four years of the band, I had two Rose Bowl trips. In 1992, the OSU Marching Band was invited to the 1993 
Midasuji Parade. Dr. John Woods graci graciously declined the offer since the parade date was um, in direct conflict with an OSU football game, and instead he suggested that they invite the OSU marching band alumni. Brad McDavid, who is now the director of bands and the marching band director at the University of Washington, he got with the scoreboard crew and translated the message into their native language. The translation said, Welcome Osaka 21st Century Committee to Ohio Stadium. So when we arrived, there was a 20, 95 of us, and when we arrived there, we were broken up into small groups, and the university there had, uh, attached students to us. So each student, each group had a student, and that student hosted us and gave us some tours around the community. And one of their observations was that they didn't realize Americans were so much fun. They thought that we were a pretty happy group and our relationships were strong, and that quite surprised them. Because all the news they get about America is uh, on the newspapers and broadcasting, and they thought it was a mean country, people were angry with each other, and it wasn't it was pretty hostile. So, our style and our friendships and our relationships uh, have an international effect. There was also an event um, where we marched into a stadium and we were there with many um, Jap Japanese high school bands and we performed uh, for the crowds. While we were waiting to do that, the OSU alumni band was um, standing there and all of the high school, Japanese high school bands were around us. So the alumni band members picked up their horns and said, hey, let's play Hang On Sloopy for these kids. I started twirling uh, with the band and um, right in front of me was a, a Japanese drum major. And at the end of Hang On Sloopy, once we um, got done, everybody started clapping. And um, this young man that was the drum major looked at me and he didn't speak a lot of English, but he said, you are a woman with big stick. And he had the biggest smile on his face. And I knew that that meant that he, he thought I did pretty good. One of the things that um I really loved was doing a concert on the USS Missouri in Pearl Harbor. So the USS Missouri was where the treaty to end World War II was signed um, in Japan in 1945. And this boat is permanently docked at Pearl Harbor and we did a concert on the ship for the people that were there. Um, playing songs like the Navy hymn, God Bless America, it was just really amazing and I never dreamt when I made the marching band so many years ago that I would have the honor of doing something like this. It, it was, it was, I, words just can't describe what it felt like to do that, what an honor it was. Um, and one of the coordinators um, there that works at the Missouri, she came over to us afterwards and just tearfully thanked us for doing this, just how much it meant to them that we were there um, on Memorial Day weekend to do this uh, concert for them. It was uh, during an alumni game. Dr. Woods was supposed to give the North End Zone varsity band um, a ready up to get us up and um, so we can start marking time and playing along with across the field before the reg. He, needless to say, forgot to do that. <laughs> Everybody else is up marching and there we are looking around going, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So we all get up, start marking time, start playing. Um, pulled it off without a hitch. But, uh, we all agreed that we are not doing a penalty drill for this. This is not our fault. But uh, ever since that day, Dr. Woods uh, definitely earned his ready up. After becoming the first female drum major at Ohio State, the village that I'm from, Sugar Grove, Ohio, threw a Shelley Graff Day that summer. And they had a parade. Um, and I got to ride in the car. The Burn Union High School Marching Band, of which I was a part of in high school, marched in the parade and they played Hang On Sloopy. We had a big buffet, everybody brought food, and uh, Senator Valaquet had uh, given me a resolution about becoming the first female drum major that day. And it was just such a thrill uh, for the town and for me um, to know how much they were excited about me becoming the drum major as much as I was. And to this day, there are two signs in Sugar Grove, Ohio, and one as you enter and one as you leave, and they're scarlet and gray, and they say, 
home of Shelley Graff, first female drum major at The Ohio State University. On bull trips, we would fly on these wide-body L-1011 jets that were chartered. Those were pretty neat from the standpoint that we actually got to load the instruments or unload the instruments off of a plane. They'd have a conveyor belt going up in there, and at least one of the times I was able to go up the conveyor belt, I think, to help unload and actually was in uh, the luggage compartment of the of the plane. The other time helping out with instruments and usually on the bull trips we'd have two or three box trucks and I remember my my fifth year at least being able to help drive that around at least on game day so I thought that was pretty fun being in Florida in full uniform driving an equipment truck around that was at the time seemed pretty cool. So. Um, one of the years that I was in the band, I, I think it might have been in 1992 or 1993, um, we were scheduled to go to do pet bands at different places around Columbus. And one of the best ones that we could do was um, at the Liederkranz in Mansfield, Ohio. But after we were done at the Liederkranz, we went to a place um, at the Mifflin Inn which was just down the, the road in Mifflin, Ohio. One of the things that we all know about Dr. Woods, the director at the time, was that the way to that man's heart was through his stomach. He loved to eat. He loved to um, the enjoy the camaraderie around having a meal with people. And so he, one of his things that he required for us to go and stop at the Mifflin Inn was that they needed to feed us. Uh, we we disembark the bus outside the Mifflin Inn. We go in, and of course, the first thing we need to do is eat. And so I'm getting a, a plate, and Dr. Woods is in front of me, and he turns to me, and they had this. They had a ton of deli trays with lunch meats and cheese and and condiments and and all sorts of things to make your own sandwich and. Dr. Woods turned to me and with his voice, and, and I cannot do it justice, but he turns to me and goes, eh, look at this. Look at these cold cuts. Eh, look at that. I'm ham sandwich. It turned into this thing that then the marching band, um, we started doing that amongst ourselves over there. Eh, I don't like a big ham sandwich. And so all of the things that came out of and the history of where the ham sandwich references come from for Dr. Woods all goes back to this little tiny gig that we played at the Mifflin Inn uh, after the leader crunch during Michigan week where Dr. Woods turned to me uh, standing in line and talked about how great the cold cuts were and how great that ham sandwich eh, a ham sandwich was going to be uh, when he ate it before we did our performance there. Growing up in Columbus, you know, there was this mystique around the band, especially Dr. Woods. When I actually got to try out and meet him and get to know him, I realized this man, he's an interesting cat, right? I remember one time specifically, we were in the old stadium. Practice field was located right on the side of the stadium and to watch, he would usually be up on C deck looking down off the back. And whatever tro whatever show we were doing that day, he really we were really screwing it up. He didn't like it. He was really getting pissed. And he's like, eh, eh, you know what? Ah, I'm coming down there. And he starts hauling ass down these stairs. And he was this short little guy, and he had his short little legs, and he was just huffing and puffing. But the one thing he forgot to do <laughs> was turn off the mic. So he's broadcasting himself, huffing and puffing, going all the way down the stairs, man. It took about a minute and a half. And we're just cheering him on, and finally he breaks through those doors down at the ground level, and he's trucking. You think he finally realized what he did, because we're cheering him on. He's just giggling and laughing and having a good time. And I think that was probably my biggest memory is of him, Dr. Woods and his little quirks. And to this day, I can't look at a ham sandwich without going, hey, ham sandwich, yeah. It's, it's those little things that stick with you. My real standout from that year, though, was my first script, my first pregame, happened to be homecoming that year. Uh, that was the same game against Wisconsin that Woody Hayes dotted the eye. And you can see here in the scrapbook, there's the drum major, Bruce Hart.
escorting Woody to the top of the eye. Pre-game ramp entrance from that year. A banner with Woody's image on it. And then we broke into the script and you can see Woody coming up the side of the O uh, where Bruce Hart met him and took him to the top of the eye. We finished tryouts up midweek on Wednesday, I would say. And the following weekend we had an Ohio State home game. And then the next day on Sunday, we had to perform a single script Ohio up in Youngstown at Boardman High School as we were on our way to Monday Night Football in Buffalo, New York. So we performed Script Ohio on a high school lined field after having performed everything on the college lined field the day before. And then on that Monday, we performed up in Buffalo's um, stadium for Monday Night Football on a professional uh, lined field. So we had to learn our shows and everything, you know, in a couple of days. And it was interesting because each field was um, a little bit different, but we made it through fine. Uh in, I think it must have been the 75 Rose Bowl, uh, every year we had, the managers would march for somebody. They have a knee problem, an ankle problem, somebody be injured, sick, whatever. And one of our managers uh, knew that athletes always tape their ankles. I knew that, okay. Well, what he didn't really think it through because he didn't realize that before they tape their ankles, they shave their ankles. Well. He wanted to tape his legs, so he taped them, got the adhesive tape out, taped them from his ankles to his hips, both legs, no shaving involved. When he marched the parade, in the process of three hours of marching, that adhesive tape bonded together, became like a cast. Well, at the end of the game, we held him down, somebody found the end of the tape somehow, and we went zing, 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 round and round and round and round, and I don't think he's ever been able to look a piece of adhesive tape in the eye since then. I mean, we couldn't, <laughs> it, was, it was awful. I could tell you 500 stories about my time in band, but really what it boils down to are all the times I spent with the fun, crazy, uh, great people that were in band with me. Uh, for example, uh, Dave Kastner's Fessler Knight talent. Beating Michigan 22 to 6 in 1994, and we just went crazy because unfortunately that was the only time out of five years that we had done it. Going to uh, Penn State on the Kappa Kappa side trip, and somehow a lot of us ended up in the ball pit at McDonald's. This crazy balloon hat that I got at uh, Church Street Station on New Year's Eve, and all of my roommates were almost mortified that I was wearing it, but by the end of the night, they were stealing it off my head and dancing around with it because it was just so epic. You know, my friends, Jeremy, Mike, and Skater in particular, and going with all of x -Row to the band dance, where the year that we marched so many parades in Orlando that in between, say, the third and fourth one, we all just fell asleep on the sidewalk. The last highlight I remember from being in band was uh, getting in the Columbus Dispatch um, with the highlight snoozing between tunes because during a water break I managed to catch a, a five minute nap. One other wonderful memory that I have um, is getting to perform abroad with the OSU Alumni Band. We performed in Japan at the Mitsuchi Parade. Uh, we performed in Ireland in the real St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, performed on an Alaskan cruise um, and we stopped in Juneau and had a, had a concert there. Uh, performed in Hawaii at the King Kamehameha Parade and marched a six-mile parade. Uh, wow, uh, what, what fun though we had. Um, but with all of these events, um, everybody knew the OSU marching band, knew the traditions, it has just been, it was just such a thrill uh, to get to be the drum major and one of the drum majors uh, that led the band in all those um, events. On bus trips that we would take for away games, I seem to recall the instruments always being a challenge because we never, we had six charter buses, we never took a truck, so we had to get all instruments underneath the buses in the compartments. And in, inevitably there would be when the band members would load up, a lot of them, trombones and baritones, would just kind of throw them in there. It wouldn't be organized. So a lot of times we would have to pull those out, and inevitably there'd be sousaphones left that needed to be stuffed in there. So 
a lot of times the whole band would be loaded up in the buses and we'd be out there throwing things out trying to get those last couple sousaphones in there to the point where the Commodores were coming off the bus wondering what was going on and then eventually Dr. Woods would kind of wander down and off of his bus like, hey, are we ready? So that was always interesting trying to get everything packed for a trip to Michigan State or Penn State where we were going. When the band went to Ann Arbor for the 1981 Ohio State versus Michigan game and if you ever thought you understood this rivalry you came to a new understanding after experiencing it from being in the band and going to that stadium in Ann Arbor. So one of the first things that happened to us is as we were marching to the stadium we were told by our veteran band members that the smaller people in the band, the females and other people, had to be in the middle of the ranks so that the fans didn't drag us into the crowd and beat us up because this had happened in prior years. So that was our first introduction. Then when we got in the stadium and we did our ramp entrance where the band marches in from the sides, it had been very cold that week, snowy, and this gave the fans lots of ammunition. They were throwing oranges and balls of ice at us the entire time we were on the field. It was like a hailstorm. It wasn't two or three, it was constant. You were constantly pulling your horn away from your mouth to not let it knock your teeth out. And this was just constant. We were getting hit by this. It just never ended the entire pregame. And then when we came off the field, okay, so the great news is we won this game. At the end of third quarter, we um, were sitting there and somebody from their stadium, one of the security people, came over and said, you need to get your band out of the stadium now because we can't guarantee their safety. I mean, really, the band. The band's going to get beat up because Michigan's team didn't win. <laughs> so we had to leave. So we're on the buses to get ready to leave, and we're all getting loaded up sitting there, and we're sort of hearing the end of the game on the radios or whatever, and we, we won. That was great. Well, one of the Michigan fans thinks it's a great idea to steal one of the drums from underneath the uh, luggage area of the bus. So the drummers see this person running off with one of the drums and so they all clear out and take off after this guy and um, one of our directors that was on that bus, Willie Sullivan, um, he was from the south, had a neat southern accent and as all these guys were clearing out of this bus ready to go after this guy, all he said was, don't kill him. It's almost impossible for me to choose a favorite memory of my time in band because so much of who I am today was because of my time in the OSUMB. However, what I'm choosing to share is something that the 2012 OSUMB only knows about. The story starts late in the 2011 season when we played a classic show featured The Great Gate of Kiev from Pictures at an Exhibition. Now in 2011, John Waters was the assistant director and he took on conducting duties for this tune. John's conducting style was enthusiastic. He threw himself into the piece, more or less. And what John didn't know was that for this particular piece during concert week, we recorded him from behind the risers on stage. So fast forward to 2012 at F night, Kelro prominently featured this exclusive footage we had captured the season prior, except that now we were able to share it with the entire band. And it had a complete voiceover from some of the OSUMB's finest members. John, didn't appreciate it as much. We had Ohio State University um, envelopes. Uh, the, the, every department did not have their own, they just had an Ohio State thing. So when I would mail things out, the return address, uh, I had to put it in. And I, for Don McGinnis, it would be his initials. But for Jack, he was Jack Oliver Evans was his name. And so I would abbreviate J O E, and then, and then uh, I had to put music after it. So the, we had people coming in inquiring all the time who Joe Music was, <laughs> and I, I always thought that was funny. And I don't know uh, that the band sings to their director anymore, but in those days, the band would sing to their directors, and uh, I don't remember. I never could get it straight what they were singing for Jack, but was uh, it always started out, Mr. Evans is our hero, our hero, our hero. Mr. Evans is our hero, our hero is he. And then the next part I never can remember, but it, I'm not sure But what, maybe it was an insult because he looks like a greyhound, he runs like a dachshund. Mr. Evans is our hero, our hero is he. 
and they would harmonize that last line. Oh, they'd harmonize the, the heck out of it. It was just gorgeous, you know. I never knew whether Jack appreciated it or not, but they sang that. And then when Charlie came along, it was, um, We love you, Charlie. Oh, yes, we do. We love you, Charlie, and we'll be true. We love you, Charlie. We're true. Oh, Charlie, we love you. I was surprised I made it. I was excited about getting the final pass the final cuts. Problem is, I had a con schedule complex. I had math and English at 4 and 5 o'clock. After the announcement of the band, who was going to be in the band, uh, Jack Evans asked if there was anybody who had any complex from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Oh, well, yes, I do. So I had to get an off line outside of his office, and he'd give us papers to go and take to our department, the English department and the math department. I took the uh, papers signed by Jack O. Evans up to the English department, which is at Denny Hall, and uh, gave the paper up there, and they saw Jack O. Evans signed it. Oh, this is good. We can, give you, we can transfer you. We can give you a different time. That, that went smooth. Then I went to uh, the math department, which is in a new math building at that time, and I got in a line there, a longer line, and uh, there's people coming out in there saying that they couldn't get their schedules changed. I'm beginning to get nervous then. Thinking this isn't going to work too well. When I got up there, the first scheduler uh, was looking at uh, Jack Owens, but you know, I said, I don't know what I can do for you. He couldn't get me in another slot. Another scheduler came up and uh, he found a slot at 9 o'clock in the morning. I thought, hey, this is great. Now I can get in the band. I can have the Ohio State University March Band on my schedule. The band has made a big impression on my whole life and been a big influence to how I've led my life. Pick up your feet, turn your corner square. Drive, drive, drive. Dr. Woods was the director at the time, and he was notorious for being late to rehearsal. So one day when that happened, um, he parked, there was a parking spot right outside of the band center door, and it was a no parking zone. And he parked his white uh, Chrysler Cordoba that he drove with all sorts of bondo and uh, paint that was coming off of it what he didn't realize is that when he was in that hurry that there was um, tow trucks that were towing people off of the stadium band lot um, outside on the west side of ohio stadium and so they hooked his car up to the tow truck and while they did that um, some of the managers up on the third floor of the band center noticed that they were doing this and so a very smart manager, Dave Mailer, went and grabbed a video camera, ran downstairs from the third floor to the location of where Dr. Woods' car was being towed. And he proceeded to interview the tow truck operator, show them hooking up Dr. Woods' car to the tow truck, and interviewing him the entire time, asking him questions about where the car would go, what kind of what kind of things was he doing that day? How many cars did he tow? Those kind of things. And so once they were done with this two minute interview, um, the tow truck driver got into his car and, and into the truck, um, pulled Doctor Woods's uh, Cordoba, white Cordoba, out of the no parking zone. The entire time that he did this, he was filming being filmed by Dave Mailer and the manager's group that was out there. Uh, Saturday, we recorded our performance. Monday comes around, and the first thing we did after attendance was look at the film from the previous week. And, and instead of the Saturday performance coming up, the entire band got to see his car get towed out and down the street and across the bridge and out of sight. As he stood there, the band just roared, and he was laughing. At the end, he was laughing. And I remember looking over at Dr. Woods, and his arms were down at his sides, looking up at the uh, the projection that was on the screens, and he kind of looked at all of us like, I cannot believe none of you jerks saved my car. And in 1972, December the 27th, the band flew to uh, Los Angeles to be in the 1973 Rose Parade and Game. 
And as part of that trip, we went to San Diego to uh, play at SeaWorld. And on the way back, I was sitting in the front of the bus with Paul Drosty and Jim McCurry, who's the band doctor. And uh, we once we start with stadium stories, there's no stop on us. So we've been sharing stadium stories. And we got to Ports of Call. It uh, was a square of stores uh, with a hollow courtyard in the middle. And you could go from store to store. Paul said, do you want to go with us? And I'm sure I'd never hung around with anybody in, in the staff before. But so off we went. Well, the first store we went into was Fine China. And I'd been around Paul for two years for pre-games, half times, everything. He'd never been nervous. He was petrified because there were hummels and precious moments there. He just knew we were going to crash into something and have to buy something, end up buying our mistakes or something. So he said, let's get out of here. We went to the next store. It was a candy store. Up and down a few aisles we went, picked up a box, went up to the counter, and he said to the cashier, if my name matches the name on this box, do I get a discount? It was a box of Drosty chocolates. And she said, oh, she said, are you out here for the game? He said, yes, I'm the director of the OSU marching band. And I'm standing there with my cane, waiting to go, you know, to go on to get something to eat or whatever we were going to do. He taps me on the shoulder and says, and this is my drum major. So somewhere in California today, even, there's probably a woman in her, you know, she's probably older than I am now, that has a few drinks at the end of the day and swears up and down that in 1973 Rose Parade and game that the drum major for the OSU marching band was blind. There tended to be some antics in the old stadium band room when it came to like videos and such. There was a, the video system consisted of a, of a large projector and then because the band room was kind of wonky there were two smaller TVs up in front but this was in regards to the projector every time we would watch a video on whatever day the the screen would have to be pulled down because it kind of blocked the podium so there seemed to be an ongoing game between the sousaphone section and dr woods and the directors about the location of the string to pull down to the point where sometimes dr woods would not be able to reach up and pull the, the screen down when it was time to watch a movie so he had to look back and usually Someone tall like uh, Brad McDavid, graduate assistant, would have to come out and try and... Eventually it was to the point where he was actually having to try and jump up to get the screen to pull it down, much to the enjoyment of the, uh, the crowd in the band room. On September 25th, 1999, I was late on game day. That's right, game day. I woke up that morning at approximately 5.15, realizing that I should already be dressed and at the stadium band room for the noon kickoff. At the time, I was living with my parents in Pickerington, which was not a short drive to campus, so I knew it would be almost impossible for me to make it to the 6 a.m. report time. I quickly got dressed, grabbed my instrument, and headed out the door. As I was leaving, I told my parents that Dr. Woods was probably going to suspend me for the Wisconsin game since being late was not tolerated. I drove as fast as my sweet college student ride would take me towards campus, praying that I did not get pulled over the entire way. Arriving on campus, I parked across the river on Coffee Road, grabbed my instrument, and sprinted towards the band room. As I was crossing the river, I heard the drums almost at the end of their cadence, and at this point, I knew I was screwed. Being that it was my last year in band and assuming that I was going to be suspended for a game for being late, I was not in the mood to go into the band room for the flaming that I knew was coming. So as the band played Buckeye Battle Cry, I made my way upstairs to the locker room to get dressed better since I was a mess from rushing. Later on, the assistant squad leader, Mary Martin, told me that when Dr. Woods conducted roll call and she announced M1, everyone gasped. Once the band finished watching the grade A video and started making her way out to the field, I went to see Dr. Woods in his office. I knocked on Dr. Woods' door and asked if I could come in, and he said sure. I told Dr. Woods that I was late this morning. He stated that he had noticed that. I apologized to Dr. Woods for being late and waited for him to deliver my fate for the next game. As I nervously stood in front of Dr. Woods, he leaned back in his chair and told me that he had a story for me. Dr. Woods said that when he was on his way home last night after practice, he realized that all three of his uniforms were still at the dry cleaners, which was closed, and he had nothing to wear for game day. Dr. Woods then looked up at me, smiled, and said, you see, it happens to the best of us, and that I was here now, so it was okay. I left Dr. Dr. Woods' office re relieved that he did not suspend me, and also confused since I'd never seen that side of him. To this day, I can still see him smiling 
at me as he sat in his chair. And I've been uh, lucky enough to get to travel with the Hyper Band on the Buckeye Cruise for Cancer. And one fun thing that happened to me on the cruise was when Mel Ponzi uh, was in charge of the Hyper Band. He had gotten t-shirts uh, for the band to wear at one of our performances on the ship. And on the back of my shirt, it says, I'm Shelly. And on the front, it had the OSU alumni logo. And as we're walking out, uh, one of the uh, people uh, said hello to us and said, oh my gosh, I love your shirts. And so Nancy uh, turned around and her shirt and all the other band shirts, I come to find out, said, I'm with Shelly. And my shirt said, I'm Shelly. Uh, because on the cruise, they always tease me that the band and everybody loves Shelly and um, they don't even know who they are, but that's not really true. Um, it's very fun. It's a very fun event. I'm so um, happy that I've been able to be a part of that. Um, I've helped with Reunion for many years now, and so a lot of my memories are based on how old my children were, um, from having them in a little baby pack in the front to a backpack on the back, um, to when they finally got old enough that I could deputize them to help with stuffing party, um, water crew, um, and, and so they, they've been asked to do some of the craziest things like guard row mascots as, as they come into the stadium um, or push Tony Violi in a wheelchair um, when he got hit by a car the day before reunion and, and couldn't march uh, at age 97, um, where my daughter was supposed to help a man, um, Howard Doster, uh, find his spot in morning rehearsal and he ended up spending literally the rest of the eight hours, uh, 10 hours that they were together telling him, her all about his life and time in the band. Like I said, I always wanted to be the band director of the Ohio State Band. I thought that would be great, but of course I knew it was an impossibility at the time. But I wanted to wear that hat and I had a key to rehearsal hall, but of course I was never supposed to be in there unless I had permission. Well, I didn't have any permission for this, but I was going to get a picture of me in that hat. So my girlfriend and I drove down there one Sunday afternoon and campus was dead, you know. And uh, I got us into the building and we went into the office and I put that thing on my head. It was Mr. Weigel's old desk behind me. And uh, uh, the telephones on the wall. Incidentally, they still have the same phone number they had when I was in school. I think that's funny because in those days they had a, had a name first. Uh, evidently, you couldn't remember six numbers or however many. Uh, and it was Axminster uh, and then went into the, the numbers. So it was AX and Ax meant your horn in those days in jive talk. So anyway, there's Janet and I'll tell you, I think we spent all the five minutes in there before we got out. But Jack was a very sociable kind of person and uh, enjoyed being with students. They, I, I think we were kind of their kids. They never had children, so um, we kind of did that. And we would think up reasons to go over to their apartment. They lived in Olentangy Village at the time. And uh, <laughs> we, one year we went Easter caroling and we sang all the Easter hymns out in front of the, I don't know what the neighbors thought of Jack, but I'm sure they loved having him there. In February 1964, the Beatles came to America. In the fall of that year, OSUMB tried to recreate some of that excitement in Ohio Stadium. Our halftime show for the second game of the season on October 3rd included Beatles music. I was one of the Beatles dancing around in front of 80,000 fans. I'm pretty certain that drummer Ron Steelman, who had gone to Eastmore High School in Columbus, portrayed Ringo. Tom Bronner, who had gone to high school in Kentucky, was another Beatle. He and I ended up marching next to each other in X-Row for 1966 and 1967. I apologize for not remembering who played the part of the fourth Beatle. If you were that person, or you know who was, I would be happy to be reminded. When Anthony Violi dotted the I, instead of the crowd's noise dropping down as we were coming off the field. It kept getting louder and louder and louder. And I'm wondering what is going on. And uh, we found out later that Anthony Bioli was still on the field and he was still taking his bows. 
and um, the crowd was just going crazy for this man. And it, it sort of got me sort of choked up because I thought, you know, everybody in the stadium is younger than this man. But everybody in the stadium was just going absolutely crazy for this 100-year-old man who was out there dotting the eye. Uh, my part of the, that script was to introduce the high safe team. So I introduced the high safe team, and they said 60,000 people yelled and yelled. So I took a couple of steps. I did a fancy uh, about face. But the, those people said nobody's ever introduced us like you did. They said there was 160,000 voices there. You never heard of so much. And, and, and that was really amazing. 